Hi, that's me, two weeks ago, slicing apart 32 lovingly grown tomato seedlings and desperately trying to smash them back together again. But why? Well, the answer has something to do with the fact that all 13 of these tomato varieties taste really freaking good. If they didn't, we just go by that cardboard mush that passes for a tomato at the grocery store. But if we're being honest, none of these can really thrive in our summer heat. And they have a kind of annoying tendency to die from disease. Now contrast all that with these tomatoes that won't ever produce a single fruit worth eating, but absolutely laugh in the face of trivial things like bad weather and deadly disease. So how can we get the best of both worlds in our own home garden. The solution is right here in the ancient art of grafting, whereby we take a variety with desirable eating qualities and we grow it onto a variety with desirable toughness qualities. For instance, this Paul Robeson stem and foliage growing onto the root system of a super strong tomato rootstock tomato. That's actually its name, super strong tomato rootstock. And that's not new. Humans have been grafting plants for thousands of years around the globe, just not typically with tomatoes like this one. Or more accurately, not typically with tomato gardens at home. See, tomato grafting has traditionally really been the sole domain of professional growers. But I think the question is, why? I mean, this is YouTube gardening, right? Where we routinely recommend going through incredible lengths to get the best possible tomato garden. We start them indoors, we pot them up, we prune them, we feed them fish heads, we feed them antacids, we pour milk on them. We do all these things that are borderline superstitious in the hope of growing a healthier tomato garden. So why hasn't grafting with its clear and proven benefits become one of those steps in the quest for a perfect tomato garden. That's not a rhetorical question, by the way. I, I honestly don't know. I don't get it, but I want to know. I really, really want to know. And that's why this year we did it ourselves to find out for ourselves and to share the results with you. In today's video, I am so excited to share with you everything we had to go through to get to this final tray of 15 unique grafted tomato seedlings and the many, many things we discovered we should have been doing differently along the way. Our rootstock seedlings, they germinated in two and a half days. That is the fastest I've ever had any nightshade plant germinate ever. And they actually grew faster than the other tomato seedlings as well, which means we probably should have actually planted them two or three days after our other tomato seeds instead of planting them all on the same day, which is what we did. Before we started this whole ridiculous grafting experiment, I read every piece of advice I could find on the process. And one really strange recommendation stood out to me. A very experienced tomato grafter actually recommended trying to induce purple seedlings, like you can see on some of these plants back here. Basically nightshades, uh, when they're grown in conditions that are both very bright, but kind of on the cooler side, they can go a purple color. You, you might've run into this if you've ever grown yours in an unheated space like the garage that I am currently in. And the thing about purple seedlings is they tend to be very thick and stocky. You can kind of think of them like the opposite side of the spectrum from those sort of thin, leggy, weak, yellow, green seedlings you get when things are a little bit too warm and a little bit too dark. So yeah, that made sense to me. So I went ahead and gave it a shot. We went for purple seedlings. And I gotta tell you, I would not do it again. The problem with that is it's really easy to go too cold. And I actually ended up damaging a lot of seedlings that had nothing to do with the grafting experiment in any way. Two weeks after planting these, we started to notice a bit of a problem. They were growing so quickly, they were soon going to grow out of their original containers. But the problem is most guides recommend grafting at about 21 days, which would mean I would have had to pot up and then graft in quick succession. And that sounds like a lot of stress for these little plants. So instead, what we ended up doing is potting them up at about 15 days, which is a little bit on the early side. That said, overall, the potting process was really very simple and very similar to almost any other tomato seedling. The only thing we ended up having to do differently, other than potting them up a little bit early, is we used all new containers, brand new containers, and we used only a new bag of potting soil with no other amendments. Now, typically I would be adding compost or manure as well as extra fertilizer into the potting mix for my potted up tomato seedlings. 
but for these, we didn't want to introduce any additional vectors where diseases could enter the soil or into the plant and potentially prevent the graft from taking hold later on. We didn't pot up the scion seedlings because, well, their roots were going in the garbage anyways. Tell you what, next year, I think I'd really like to start these a little bit later so that I don't have to pot them up until after the grafting has happened and until after they're all nice and healed up, just to make it a little bit less complicated on myself. Okay, right here are all of our rootstock seedlings. And then up here, I've got just basically the leftover seedlings from when I potted up all of our tomatoes yesterday. I just left one or two of the scions in their individual uh, 72 cell trays so that we can go ahead and pop them out and put them right on top here. So I just put this uh, Super Sweet 100 seedling onto this four inch tray with the rootstock seedling. And the reason that I'm doing this ahead of time is I'm not using any labels. I just keep track of which scion corresponds to which rootstock seedling by making sure that I have them positionally correct on this tray. And then I just track it all using a little spreadsheet on my phone. We've got all of our rootstock seedlings and the scions upstairs on my office desk where I'm gonna be keeping them for about a week, hopefully until the graft has healed at this point because they're, you know, they're out of their trays. I'm considering that the clock is on and it's a race against time, but I did wanna quickly talk about the materials that I'll be using before we get started. So first off, I've got these grafting clips that I got from Tomato Supply, Tomato Grower Supply Company, I think that's it. Uh, these are 1.7 millimeter silicone grafting clips. On one side, they've got where the little graft actually goes in. This is where the tomato stem goes in. And on the, on the other side, you have a little hole for stakes. I didn't get stakes yet because it seems like most folks don't use them, but kind of a game time decision. If I decide that they're too floppy after we do the graft, I'll run out and grab some stakes for them. I've got a brand new water bottle from the dollar store. Um, just wanted to make sure that it was completely sterile and didn't have anything you know, lingering in there from an old water bottle. We'll be using this to mist the healing chamber so that we can get high humidity in there. And then the healing chamber itself is this old clear plastic bucket. I wanted something very tall, very large that can just kind of slot right on top of the actual tray. I am now a little bit nervous. That's not quite long enough. I really should have checked that, but I did sterilize this, um, literally poured boiling water all over it. It should be pretty clean. You want that to be pretty clean. And then last up, I have a little X-Acto safety blade tool that I have just been boiling. That's why it's sitting in water right now. Uh, I literally just boiled this one again and cleaned it pretty thoroughly. So hopefully that'll be good to go. Ooh, let's get started. I'm kind of nervous, nervous and excited. This is a big deal for me. I've been wanting to do this for a very long time. We want to take a look at the stem thickness for each of these. One of the most important things is that we are matching the stem thickness. I mean, they look very, very similar to me. It's hard to eyeball when we're talking about the difference between like 1.5 millimeters and 1.7 millimeters but they do look very, very similar. If they weren't similar, what you could do is kind of decide where on the rootstock seedling and where on the scion seedling you wanted to cut. The other decision that we have to make right now is do we want to cut the rootstock seedling above or below the cotyledon? So if we, if we cut the, the rootstock seedling below the cotyledon, we remove all risk of fruiting growth ever happening on the rootstock seedling. It will never create suckers because this is just the meristem. And that's nice because you're never gonna accidentally waste growth on rootstock seedling, which you can't eat, eat the, the tomatoes that it produces. But if you cut it up higher, like say above the cotyledons, you're just doing a better job of separating the grafting spot from the soil. And that's really that's really what we're doing here, right? We wanna make sure that the only plant that is touching, the only tissue that is touching soil or even near soil is the rootstock because we wanna avoid those uh, soil-borne diseases. I think I am going to opt for cutting below the cotyledon, even though I think it would be more optimal to cut above just because I don't think there's enough room above the cotyledon just at the, the stage that I'm doing it. I'm doing this at about 21 days after seeding because that was recommended by one of the guides that I read. Um, and I just don't think the size really makes sense to do it above the cotyledon. So I'm gonna try and do it right below the cotyledon and we're gonna go for a 60 degree angle here. You want it to be quite a sharp angle. Okay, we've got a sharp little angled cut on one of our rootstock seedlings. <laughs> 
it's here. Next step, we wanna go ahead and put the grafting clip on there. We wanna make sure that the grafting clip opening, no, that actually seems to fit pretty nicely to be honest. Oh, I think that's a good size. I think we chose a pretty good size here. It's sticking on quite nicely. Yeah, some folks find it easier to cut the scion seedlings on like a flat surface just in order to get a really nice deeply angled cut. Obviously the more important thing is that the cut angle corresponds cleanly to the angle on the cut that you made on the rootstock seedling. Okay. Ah, ah see, I, I don't think I got it deep enough. That's not, that's not a great cut. Um, so we'll have to try and do a little bit better on the next one. That looks much better to me. That looks much better. Oh my goodness, that actually looks not horrible. That looks not horrible. I'm pretty happy with it. I'm pretty darn happy with it. This is fun. Totally not terrifying. Ah, you know what though? You know what I didn't like about this one that I just did? I did it too low down and I don't want the graft to be that close to the soil. I'm gonna just try and make sure that this time I do a better job of matching that angle. And that actually looks like it just fit on there kind of beautifully. So that, that worked out nicely. Man, that is really fun to do. I'm going way too slow though. I'm going way too slow. These guys are gonna be damaged if I don't hurry up here. We've got ourselves some grafted seedlings and you can see they are looking droopy and sad. So I'm gonna go ahead and get them into their little healing chamber. I'm misting the healing chamber walls and ceiling to just create a high humidity environment. You don't actually want the soil to be too moist. The actual like physical cellular action by which the plant draws moisture up its tissues can cause the graft to fail. It can cause the, the tissues of the two different plants to disconnect. And so you don't want the, the soil itself to be too super moist. It's okay if there's a little bit of light, like that's why it's okay to be using a clear dome rather than an opaque like black plastic dome. Um, but you don't want a lot of light. Basically just want to leave them in a high humidity environment with a little light and no wind and no, like, basically just nothing to disturb them. Alrighty, we are gonna be breaking the rules a little bit and opening this sucker up on the first day. Went out and just got a couple small little dowels to use as support, just because I felt like there was too much sort of shearing pressure, right? Like the, the gravity of that scion was causing a little bit more pressure on the actual graft, right? So it was kind of falling a little bit than I would like. So I figured we might as well give them a little bit of support in the form of a stake. Ideally though, you would not be opening up this healing chamber for I think two to three more days. I'll be showing you um, every time we actually make the change. So I'll document that. But for now, we're gonna break the rules a little bit here. Open it up, let the air out, rehydrate it, get some stakes in there. I think I'm gonna take it slow and easy and just introduce a little bit of both. Introduce a little bit of airflow by very slightly propping open the humidity dome with just a couple little plastic risers I have here and then popping our blinds here behind me and letting in a little bit of natural light. Not too much on either side. Come back in a day or so and see how it goes. All right, y'all, it is day four, 72 hours after the graft, and I'm just gonna make a few more changes today to slowly acclimate these grafted seedlings. First off, I'm gonna go ahead and remove the humidity dome just to get a little bit of fresh air in and around the plants, and then I'm gonna re-humidify it by just spraying the sides down with some clean water. I'm gonna be leaving the heat mat on. I'm gonna go ahead and make sure they remain warm at this point. And then when I put the humidity dome back on, I'm gonna go ahead and add a couple more of these little risers. Maybe I'm just adding a little bit extra airflow and reducing that overall relative humidity. And then I've gone ahead and opened up my window blinds as far as they will go, meaning I have as much light on these seedlings as I can give them at this point, which admittedly isn't that much without actually removing the humidity dome. That's it, let's go ahead and get started. 
Alrighty, day five, four days after grafting, let's make our changes for the day to continue acclimating these plants. I think first off, it is time to go ahead and remove the heat mat. The location where these will be going in a few days time is not only much cooler, but it fluctuates a lot more because it's in my garage and our weather is a little bit insane right now. Now, just temporarily here, I'm gonna go ahead and remove the humidity dome. I'm just wetting that down again, just spraying the sides, spraying the top. I'm gonna go ahead and keep the humidity dome on because I am genuinely confused as to whether or not I can begin safely actually watering the soil. It's not really clear to me at what point the plants can start tolerating that. The only other thing that I'm gonna do real quick is replace the heat mat with a light. Now this isn't something I would necessarily recommend you do as well just because they're you know this could get too hot this particular brand of light i know because i've been using it for years and years whoa it doesn't get hot at all it like puts off no heat and i'm only gonna have it on when i'm literally sitting at this desk on my computer it's only a couple hours at a time the next day and the big change that we've made for the day is i'm taking off the humidity dome as you can see here we're starting to have some like edema issues the leaves are just not looking very healthy this one's getting etiolated got what might be some fungus growing on the bottom of one of these leaves. Overall, I just think that the, the humidity dome is starting to do uh, more harm than good. So we're gonna go ahead and remove that. Gonna go ahead and just water down the soil a little bit as well. Then the only other thing that I'm doing is giving them a little bit more light for more hours because tomorrow it is back to the seed starting rack they go with lots of light and a whole lot less heat. Okay, next day and it is their first day in their new location down on our seedling rack. So to start with here, just to adjust them to the new spot, we've gone ahead and put them on a seedling heat mat to keep them warm. It's much, much cooler down here. And then I've got one light on them uh, kind of high up here just for the entire tray. Whereas tomorrow we will be putting them in their final location. And this is, has three lights on the same number of plants. So just a lot more light starting tomorrow. I've also given them a nice drink of water just by pouring it into the drainless tray right here, which is how we water all of our seedlings. And they seem to tolerate that just fine, no issues. They're not popping off the rootstock or anything. Finally, I think I'm gonna go ahead and call it quits tomorrow on the three seedlings that just never seem to recover, unfortunately. But hey, 13 out of 16 is not too bad. All right, here they are on the seedling rack, right alongside all of the rest of our plants. I think for the purposes of this little experiment, I'm considering them uh, back to normal. It has been 10 days since we grafted these seedlings. And against all odds, two out of the three seedlings that I thought were goners have actually risen from the grave and they look okay. All right, actually they look terrible, but they're alive. And that gives us a success rate of about 94%. Although I think I'm using success kind of loosely there because overall these plants look sort of terrible. They're a little bit diseased and they're a little bit damaged. In fact, let me compare them to this tray of standard tomato seedlings that were started on the exact same day, same time, same conditions. They're big, they're beautiful, they're green. They even smell better and they have absolutely no signs of any issues or leaf diseases. But if reports are to be believed, these rootstock seedlings, they're not only gonna catch up to those normal seedlings, they're gonna put them to shame. Which is why I hope you'll stick around for a couple of months because we will be making a follow-up part two video on exactly how these rootstock seedlings compared to our standard seedlings in our summer tomato garden. I can't wait to show you.